Hello, good day and welcome back. So in this section, we're going to be looking at implementing IO Reader for our person struct. And this is going to be slightly different than the other ones that we've done where we, or at least in the previous section of this very chapter, where we just sort of call implemented the IO Reader interface on a different type, like our own name type call read counter or something. And then we just sort of count up how many bytes or how many times the interface was called. Here, we actually want to take a person object and encode it as a series of bytes. If you remember, when we the last thing we did in our IO Writer um, uh, chapter 10 on IO Writer is we assumed that we had a set of bytes and we said, okay, how can we write this now, those set of bytes, into a person object and make it a valid person? Now we sort of want to do the um, opposite of that, which is what I did, but never showed you, was to turn a valid um, person into a set of bytes so that you can then put it on the wire, like I said before, when you were doing the, the right interface, then imagine that oh, you got this over the wire from a file. Now, to help you, if you're having problem trying to figure out when you have an opt interface, or a type, sorry, and you want to implement an interface, especially the IO Writer and IO Reader interface, to help you try and figure out which way the data should be moving. Because remember, for the IO Reader and for the IO Writer, the function signatures are the same, meaning that the parameter you pass to them is a slice of bytes, and what is returned is an int and an error. And so the only difference is really the name of the function. So do you know when you're going to provide a buffer that's empty and expect it to be populated with stuff? Or when are you going to provide a buffer with data and then know that all the object upon which you call it will change? So here's how I like to think about it. Replace the name person with file and assume that you have a file structure or a file object and you're implementing IO um, reader and writer interface for it. Now, if you're calling the right method on a file, what would you expect? Now, again, you're giving it a buffer on that right method. What do you expect if this thing that you're calling it on is a file? You would naturally expect that if you say write to a file, you're providing data that's going to be written out to that file. And the file here, the object um, that represents a file, abstract away the detail of where the file is stored and all this other detail stuff, right? And the same thing, if you have a file and you say read and you provide a buffer, you're expecting that data would come from the file object and go into your buffer that you provided when you do a read. So now if we replace that with person, we'd expect the same thing. When we do person that read, we're expecting the representation of a person, whatever is encapsulated there in that structure, should somehow um, be encoded and represented into the buffer. So with that out of the way, and I hope that helps some of you who might have problems trying to figure out which way the data moves, but with that out of the way, let's go implement, because this is going to be a long chapter, but uh, as always, since the beginning of this series, I prefer to spend time trying to explain something to you that you understand than trying to rush through it and make it a really short video and still you don't learn anything. You know, you've probably had some training courses where you went training for a week and afterward you couldn't even, you know, do anything with the material. So here I really want to make you understand this material so you can think that or you can do stuff with it and if you choose to, you can go use it. So let, let's get into it. So to help save us some time, however, I did start coding a little bit, but I haven't written anything that you haven't seen me um, wrote before like at least 10 times. And so here is our uh, program and I have a person struct and I have a name as a string and age as unsigned eight. And we explained this before why this is that, that way and a social security number. If you're somewhere else in the world and you don't like eight character or this format of social security number that we use in the United States and you have a national ID to use a different number, please, I encourage you to actually use that, modify the program accordingly and see it work, okay? Um, actually, just changing the name of how many characters here, you don't have to specify anything here, um, You, but um, you know, change the example in terms of the code here, um, the example here, and then you'll see how it will still work. All right. So, of course, it's not going to work for reading, uh, for write, because we are coded 11, but let's just stick to this. So what I've done, um, 
<clears throat> again, I'm trying to stay focused here, but I keep digressing. So I've created three persons and um, given them name, age, and um, of course their social security number. And I have a buffer that I've created of 200 bytes. And I said, well, again, we're doing read. So I'm expecting that whatever the representation of Bob is in the structure, when I do a read, it should populate the buffer. Remember if I was, if Bob was a file I was talking about, and I say Bob that read, I would expect data to come from the file into this buffer. And if I said Bob that write, and I had a buffer, data that's in this buffer would have been written out to this file, Bob. But it, Bob is not a file, it's a person. So I'm doing read and I want a representation of Bob to end up in this buffer. And so same thing for Mary. Now down at the bottom here, I have the skeleton or um, stub for our person um, that read, which is just a receiver on person. And since we don't need to modify the person when we're reading the data out to um, encode it into bytes, I don't need a pointer. And then here is our buffer P that this data is gonna go into. For now, I just say that oh, we're not really doing anything, so I'm gonna return N with a zero byte because we're not affecting this buffer in any way, and nil, of course. Here is just the implementation in case we wanna print out a person. So I'll leave that in place, but our Stringer interface implementation. All right, so this should work. Go run uh, main. And so we could see our buffer of 200 bytes and it's empty because we haven't done anything in our buffer. So let's think about how we might want to encode some data into this buffer. Well, imagine that if I was able to write some bytes when I call Bob that read and it was encoding some data into this byte, what might that look like? Well, we expect that the first location here to be modified and a series of bytes to be modified to represent the encoded form of that person, right? So let's just do that. So let's just say, and we're just gonna guess for now. We're gonna say that um, when we encode a person, it takes 60 bytes to do that. Again, this is just a guess. We're gonna work our way up to doing it properly. But we're just gonna say it takes 60 bytes. So what we should expect is from here, the 60 bytes, the very first one is zero to 59, should be, because we're doing zero base, should be um, occupied. So why don't we do P that zero and set it equals to something. So this is a character. So I'm gonna set it equals to some character um, X and this is gonna be converted to a byte and so I'll see the byte representation of X, okay? And of course, since we're saying that oh, it use up um, 60 bytes, well, it's from zero to 59, which is L minus one, is equals to, I'm gonna put that as the ending character also to say that oh, anything from zero to L is um, the character I wanna use. And so um, if I rerun this now, it looks like this. So from here to there. And so I can do a little bit better. I can actually say that um, the character I wanna use is, let's call it M. So M colon equals, X is the character I wanna use. And so I'm gonna encode this by doing for um, I colon equals to zero, I is less than um, L, I plus plus, and then I can say P of I, you know, is equals to M. So I essentially copy M to those 60 bytes and, oh, wait a second, M is a character and what is it saying? Um, oh, it's a rune, so I can um, think, so um, let me cast that to a actual byte. Byte that, okay. So I'm gonna save it, okay? And so now you see my 120 um, value there, tick occupying those um, 60. And the reason why it shifted over differently is because instead of just showing zero, it's now showing three digits, so that's that. Now, when I call this for each one of these, it's actually reusing the same offset into this buffer. So a way to see that problem is, let's say, that I actually created a, a uh, variable here, call it um, markers. And I know this is gonna seem very contrived what I'm doing, but I want you to understand and picture how data is being written into the buffer. That's why I'm going through all of this. And let's just say 
it's a slice of um, runes, you know, characters, um, or bytes rather. And um, we're going to say X. Um, let's do A, B, C, and come on, um, D, E, for example. And so those are my markers I'm going to use to represent each object. And I want a global variable counter, right? And I'm going to make that zero. And so every time you call this byte function, because those values are global to my program, every time you call this function um, read, what I'm going to say is assign to it, you know, marker of count, counter. And then, of course, the next time I, I, I want counter to be something else, so for the next person who calls it, so the first time I come in, counter is zero, so marker of counter is going to give me A, and then I'm going to use A to represent where I've written the data for that first call to this function for Bob. And the second time I call it for Mary, well, it's going to pick up the next marker and write it and so on and so on. So I can do this up to, you know, six times or five times, five times, but I only call in this function three times so far, so I should be fine. And so when I look here, I see it, oh, oh, I'm overriding the data, which is exactly what we expected and what we said before, because I'm writing into the same buffer. So even though my buffer is big enough, how do I know my buffer is big enough? I'm only using 60 per um, object. I really should be writing the first one here then the second one from here to somewhere there or wherever, and then follow it on with the next one, okay? But that's not happening. Now, we're returning here n. Now, n is zero. So that is wrong. We're supposed to be returning l because we're saying that we're writing 60 bytes into this buffer. So I should return how many bytes I've used up in this buffer. So that's 60. So I need to sort of save that. And so I'll create some variables to save that. So I'm gonna say, um, um, n, you know, var n uh, is an integer, but um, I'll do it simpler, is equal to zero, and then error is from the error um, thing, okay, error interface, okay, good, so there's a value of the error interface, and so now I can say n, comma, err is equals to that, and now I can copy that, here and paste it here and that's why I wanted to declare it first because the first one time I could have done this colon equal and then the rest the other times but I want to make all of them the same so now the first time I call Bob if if you let's walk through this Bob is gonna start right in at the beginning of my buffer so at offset 0 and then it's gonna return 60 so the next time I call to write into this buffer really I really want to offset it by saying don't write there but write from you know, this offset 60, because I know if it returns 60, it really used from 0 to 59. So the next call should write from location 60. So this is perfectly fine on how much it's needs. And then when I get back another value, again, it's going to be 60 this time, I really need it to be, you know, n plus um, or 2n, for example, 2 times n offset like that. Or another way of thinking of it is the previous offset plus, you know, uh, previous offset plus the new n. But I'm overwriting n, so I can't really use this. Um, and it's not always going to be n. So this is going to work because n is 60. And, uh, but it's, if some, when I really write this code, as you can see, this is going to take 11 bytes. This is going to take one byte because it's a value under 255. And then it's going to vary. So writing Bob is going to take a different size than writing number of bytes than writing Mary. So I really can't use this code. So it looks like what I need is some offset. And so I'm going to create another variable here called offset. It's an integer. And so what I'm going to do is say, that oh, I want you to write at this offset into the buffer. OK, for the first user. And offset again is initialized to 0. So the first time, nothing has really changed here from what I had. It's just now I'm using a variable to make future calls to this buffer um, easier and you know I could potentially put in a loop or something so offset of zero to the rest of the buffer how much you use you use n so the next time I need to call this I'm gonna say well okay I'm using offset to represent where to write into this buffer so after this point 
offset must be updated with n, right? Because that says I've used n um, bytes, so I should advance my offset. So um, the next time I go to use offset, it's at the correct location of 60. And then again, after I finish here, offset should again be updated uh, by n, whatever this n is. Okay. Um, and again, this is going to work regardless of if the first time is 60, the next time is 7 or something, as we will see. And then, of course, I want to just use offset now because my offset been updated. And then, again, after this, I want to adjust my offset um, so that if I need to write... Uh, if I need to write something else in there, that's fine. So one of the things we're having now is this error message about, um, well, I don't know about that error message, but I know the error message here should be about the fact that um, we are not printing out an error message using error. So if nil, nil, not equals to ERR, then I want to do FMT, you know, or uh, log that fatal F and then, you know, the number is percent %v, and the error is colon percent %v, a new line, and then n and error. So if we have an error, I want to see what the last value of n was, and of course the error. And so let me let that save, and what is going on here? So n comma error is equals to Jane. Um, what I made a mistake yet? Buffer offset colon that. That should be fine offset. So unexpected comma at end of statement. There's no comma at the end of the statement. Um, all right. I don't see any error. Um, I don't know why my code is not. This The fact that this is not reformatted tell me at all there's an error somewhere. But I don't see a Jane that read buffer offset colon. Yep, that says from, oh. The end here when I wrote it, I got deleted. Okay, so there we go. And so now I rerun this. And so now we see exactly what we expect. From here to there is that forest Bob. Then here is Mary. And then from 99 to, to here is Jane. Now, if this is correct, that's 120 bytes, um, 180 bytes. And so my buffer should have a remainder of 20 bytes. And so if we count it, that's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then I should see another ten below here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's telling me at all this is working well. Okay, in terms of the calculation of calling and reusing the buffer and packing in um, objects one after the other. So that this calculation here in main is correct. Now we need to go do the hard work. This is just fooling around <laughs> what we're doing so far. Now we need to go do the hard work of populating um, the data into this thing. So let's think about what we want to do. We want to take R, this person, and sort of write each field into a byte. So let's see which fields we're talking about. We have name, which is a string, is the first one. How should we encode name, the string, into a byte? Well, fortunately, we can go here to the documentation and if we scroll down to, uh, stop that from ringing, to language specification, and then we click on string type, and you look at the second paragraph here, it's going to tell you that the length of a string S is the size in bytes, which is how many bytes there are in the string. That's good for us, because we can use length to figure out how many bytes there are, which means this is how many bytes we're going to need to put in P, and that's going to tell us, hey, do I have enough buffer um, space in the buffer? The next thing is, and we to tell us how we can use it, but we know that, it says you can get to each byte of the string by using an index from zero. Huh. And of course, don't try to take the address of it. So that tells us exactly what we need to do. So we can go back here into our implementation of this function, and we can say, you know what? I'm going to propose that instead of trying to write into P and keep um, we're using P, and I'll show you why. It's because every time we we, up, we put stuff into P, we'll have to check and see if P, or the underlying area of P, the slice, has enough space. So what I'd rather do is cheat a little bit and create a new buffer here. I'm going to call it buff and say it's a slice of course. It's a slice of um, 
of bytes, right? And since I don't know how big it needs to be, what I'm gonna do is just append stuff to this buffer. So I'm gonna say, for example, that I know that, let's say L here, instead of constant, I'm gonna say variable L is equals to the length of R that name. So that tells us how many bytes we need for um, the string. As a matter of fact, since we know that, we can actually go down here and when we create our buffer, at least create enough space for the name, right? We can do that much. So if we call make, and we say make a slice, a runtime of this length L. So now we know at least our buffer has enough space for our name. And so how can we put stuff in this buffer? Well, it tells us, it says, so all you have to do, so let's take away this marker and stuff. We don't need those anymore. So we're gonna go away, get rid, go up, get rid of this. And so it told us, it says, you know, if you loop over it, I indexed the um, string with an index i from zero, you get each byte of it. So we can say, I wanna store into my buffer, into my buffer of i, I want to store each byte of the string. So that's r that name. And then if I index it with I, that gives me each byte. Now you might look at this and go, well, Veryl, if you're looping over each correct um, byte in the string, why not just do this for B colon equals to range over R that name, and then try to assign that to buffer, you know, I of, you know, I equals B. And maybe for the buffer, you're gonna imp increment some i that you was initialized to, you know, you can initialize to zero. So you could say i colon equals to zero, for example, using the statement initializer for a for loop. And so the problem here though, is that when you range over a, a string, you're not getting each byte, you're getting each rune. And if you remember, a rune is a type and it's not equal to a byte. It's bigger than a byte, because, a, or it could be bigger than a byte because it's using UTF-8 encoding, and we covered that in chapter two, how UTF-8 encoding could be byte if it's like ASCII, eight bits, or it could be 16 or 32 bits or whatever, right? It actually could be three bytes also. So um, the safe thing to do is to not range over it. It specifically says, if you index it with in zero, well, an integer, if you do an index, you'd get the byte. Now, if you range over it, so, very different, so careful about that. That's a little caveat. So we definitely don't wanna do a range over the string. We wanna get the length of it in terms of bytes, and then we wanna just index to get each one of those bytes, because we know, guaranteed, when you do an index like this, you get in a byte, and on, unlike when you do a range, okay? So definitely check out, for, for me um, here in the US, chances are bytes and rune, if the rune is implemented as it, when I run on my computer here as um, using one byte, it will work for me. But if you're somewhere else and a rune is going to be two bytes or four bytes, it's not going to work for you. It's not going to be the same thing. So now I'm going to copy um, my bytes there. So now that I have my, I have my bytes copied there, um, it's in a buffer. It's not in P. So I can use the copy function, which we talked about before, and the destination is P. And I want to copy these, what I have in my slice here. Okay, so now I'm still returning and only using L bytes in this buffer. So let's see if this works. So I should have the three names right after each other. So this should represent, or somewhere here should represent the um, characters for Bob and then, you know, the name for Mary and Smith and then Jane Doe. But we're gonna be able to see that in a bit just now. We're not gonna really tell. So one of the things I wanna do is document how I'm encoding this. So I'm gonna say, assuming that I have a buffer with bytes, and let's just assume that those that's what my bytes look like, um, you know, some bytes in it. Well, how do I encode a person into these bytes? Well, I have to have some idea of what the format of that encoding is gonna look like. So um, I might say, you know, the first thing I need to put in there is as we've done here, is the name. And so I can say, well, the name is what I'm gonna write in first, and that is just a slice of bytes. And then the next thing, of course, I wanna put in there is the age, for example. And we know that though, since the age is 
a byte, which is what our buffer is made up of, a slice of bytes, is big enough to all a person age. We don't expect anybody to be more than 255 year olds uh, ever, well, anytime soon. So this is a byte seems good enough. So it seems like the next thing we can do is then say that we want to put, um, we want to extend our buffer to add a person age in there. And so, okay, so I pick up where I just had to stop the recording. So let's just continue. So I haven't written any code, um, basically just clear my screen. Um, so we left off here where we say that, oh, we have this format and we already have name in there and we're gonna put the age, which is a byte. So why don't we just extend our buffer to now have um, the age in it? So we keep building up and doing our encoding in this buffer and at the end, we're gonna copy it. Now, let's do that. So. Now we have already um, put the, encoded the the name. Let's add the buffer, um, add the um, age. So we can say append, use the append function to append a byte into our buffer. And if you remember for the append function, it's you using the buffer and then the values you want to append to that buffer. So in our case, we want to append r.age, right? But r.age is an on sign eight. And so that will not work for us. So we're going to cast it to a byte because our buffer is a byte. And when you do an append, you save, of course, um, the new buffer that you might get because remember, we did the implementation of our pen might work. And so definitely in this case, we're going to end up with a new um, slice because the underlying array had to change, right? Because we only had enough for a length and we had to grow it. So again, this is stuff we covered in before in slices and so on, chapter five, I think that was. So now we have appended the H. Let's run our code and see if this works. What we should expect to see is something that looks like this, with of course three more bytes being used. And at the end of each name, we should see their age. So what are the ages we expect? It's 35, 83, and 17. So let's just run that. And let's see if that's what we're seeing indeed. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, doesn't look correct right now. At the end of this, I should expect to see. Oh, so I do expect 17, 83, and 35. Where's my 35 and, oh, there's 83. Um, where is 35? I don't see 35. So we actually have a bug in our code. And you're not seeing it here because of how the data is being written in. But if you look at what's going on here, we're saying that we're returning, we've used L bytes in this um, in P, but that is not exactly true because L represent the name of the, the length of um, the number of bytes in name. But we all actually use more than that because we appended another byte for the age. So really, what we should be returning here is length length of buff because length buff is what we actually copying to P. So it's always going to be the length of buff is the correct size. And so if we rerun this now, we're going to see what we're supposed to see, which is that 35 that was supposed that was here. And notice what was happening is that we wrote the name, and because we didn't account for the fact that we wrote an extra byte, the second name for Mary Jane, Mary Ann, was being written in the place where we had already written the age. So now we are able to account for that. And the same thing that happened before, after we've written um, the age for um, for the previous um, thing for Marianne, well, everything is now shifted over by one, we were overwriting it. And so now this is all much better. All right, so we have fixed that subtle bug. And so now we can continue going. The next thing we want to do is encode um, the social security number, right? So social security number, and we know to encode a string, or a na a string already, so byte, a slice of byte, and so, we can go grab the length of, we don't need, we can make another buffer if we, we like, but we don't want to overwrite that buffer. So we'll have to adjust things a little bit. Um, so I want to copy this piece. Be careful when you do copy and paste. Um, actually, only this piece I need. Um, so I'm going to put some comment here and say um, copy name, um, R that name. Um, copy or encode, encode, let's put encode, encode r.age, 
and now we want to encode our that social security number okay I don't need to really recreate this variable. I have a link and now is the social security number. And I don't need to make, um, I don't want to overwrite this buffer because we're using that to accumulate all the stuff that we've done so far. So I'm going to, um, well, I could call append multiple times, but that seemed a little bit, so this actually works. So let me just comment out this. And if I do, I is less than, because now L is the length of the social security number. If we do, buff equals to append onto buff and I append one byte at a time from the social security number which is a string as we know and if we access it like this it's going to give us a byte and so if I just append one byte at a time to my buffer that actually works and by the time I get to the end here now I just copy out the real buffer and I calculate the length that will work um, so we can run that and see. So encode social security number. Um, so we can do that and, oh, wait a second. What's wrong? Um, let's go back and see where we made a mistake. Um, so L is the social security number here and I've already appended my age. So if I say append buffer equals the buffer, R is social security at I, so it says, um, it expecting a oh let's see where did I make a type in a uh, mystic semicolon or new line expecting comma um, where is it talking about da -da 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 um, length is equals to that let me just review my code buff is equals to append buff comma and then r that's the security number um, of i where am I missing something? Let me come to that out and let me run this. Okay, so that works there. So um, save this and this should be fine. Let me see if there's an error is gonna think, I can't trust my editor. Okay, so that is working fine. Okay, so I am encoding my search creature number and I could see that by, here's the string for the name, age, then the social security number, and then next is the, and let's see how many characters I set for social security number. One, two, three, oh. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Then seven, then seven to seven? No, that's wrong. Um, this is supposed to be no, well, okay, maybe that's not wrong. Um, this is supposed to be start the string for the next name, Marianne, and then after that, is our age and then the numbers for our social security number and then the which looks like these guys then it's supposed to be the string name for Jane Doe and our age which is 17 followed by the characters for our social security number so it looks like it's working but there's a problem here how do we know how, when we go to read this back so we have to start thinking now we write it and we encode it we have encoded it but how do we know how many characters? That was a problem I was having just now. How many characters here represent um, the first record, the name for the first record? How do I know how much I should read those bytes to reconstruct the string? So in encoding the string, we can't just simply put um, just the correct bytes of the string because when we encode it here, we don't know when we go to, to read this back how many of these bytes represent the name before we have to stop and say, oh, the next byte is the age. Well, we know that after the age, once we find the age, we know that it's 11 bytes later is going to be the search security number and then following that is gonna be the next record. So what we need to do is actually encode how many bytes we're using for the name length or how many bytes are in the name. And so that is also going to be a byte value because we don't expect anybody's name to be more than 255 characters. That would be a pretty long name. So finally, it looked like if now we sort of have our um, in format laid out properly. So let's go and make that correction. So once we have our buffer, or we make our buffer, um, now we can... Um, we know that we're going to need to add the length of an extra byte 
to include the length of the age of this string itself. So we can say that um, we have buff of zero is equals to, you know, cast the age to, a, um, to the length to a byte, which is L. Okay. Now, once we do that, we have to start encoding the name, not from zero, but rather by offsetting it by one. So we need I plus one, right? Another way is to do the same trick that we did above here, which is to just use an offset here to keep track of where we are inside of this buffer. Um, and so we can certainly um, do that. But for this simple part here, since this is the only place where we need to adjust it, we can do it this way. The other thing we can do is make this part sort of like this part and get rid of um, not having to think about the offset. We just keep appending, appending into the buffer. Um, this we can make better also by, you know, allocating a new buffer putting in the name inside of it, um, the, the social security number, and then appending that new buffer onto buff, and then at the end, copy and buff. So there are more than one ways of doing this. Now, this video is getting pretty long, so I'm going to cut it off here. So definitely, what I'm showing you is just a simple way. It's straightforward. It's not the most optimal way. Um, there are tons of errors in this code, and I'll try and show you those right now. And so this is going to work now. So let's just run this. And... Now I can see 11 here, and that tells me that the string occupies the first record. If I can read 11, then I should know that oh, the next thing I need to do is read the next 11 bytes as the string, the name. And then after that, it's going to come the age. And then I know that our oh, social security number is always 11, so I can read that. And then now we can see the next record 15 here being how many bytes are in the next name and i can read that and then i can the age is 53 83 and then their social security number and then i should see the number of bytes for the next name which is eight bytes and then i can read that followed by the age which is going to be you know 17 and then their social security number and so we can go if you remember it was 11 15 and 8. So here, Jane Doe is definitely eight characters. This is, so is five, five, and one. That's 11. Ah, I didn't mean to do that. And this here, it says it was 15. So this is five. This is four, four. So that's eight. And five is 13. A space there, and there's dash. So again, 15. So now we know that we're encoding this properly now. And this worked. So what is the errors that I'm talking about? Well, imagine that someone tried to encode some more data. So um, let me just re-encode some more because I can certainly, uh, control Z, uh, this. So I can certainly call my buffer to encode more data. Notice how I could just copy that because the whole offset calculation now is working regardless of the size. So eventually what's going to happen is that I'm going to run out of space in my buffer. But I'm not going to know that here. It simply is going to fail silently because I'm going to try and write more data into the buffer than I can actually write into it. And um, because of how the copy function is written, even if this buffer is bigger, let's assume that P, what I pass in, had only zero bytes free in the underlying buffer, right? Because of all the offsetting calculation I'm doing here, eventually it's going to fill up. And so let's just assume that. And now I try to write a buffer of 40 because that's how much the user data encode, the person encoded to. Because of how the copy function works, it's going to see, oh, this is 40. Your underlying buffer here, is, um, rec array here is zero. So it's just going to return silently and not give me an error and not copy um, the data, right? So this could return to you how much data is actually copied, but we're not going to check that. So, well, actually, we can use that as our return value. And so that's really going to tell us how many bytes we actually use into the, copy it into this buffer. The other thing though, is if we copy less than we need to, we really should let the user know that there was an error in terms of copying data. So the one advantage of putting this here is now we can do this. We can say if length of P, if length of P is less than the length we require of buff, 
then that's an error, right? Which means P is not big enough. And so in that case, I want to return an error message, which I'm doing is S equals to FMT dot S print F. And I'm going to say buffer not big enough, um, you know, required, however you want to do this, required percentage V, um, provided percentage V. And then here I can say that oh, what we require was length of buff and what was provided was length of P. Okay, does that make sense? And then now I can say return because I didn't get to copy anything. So I didn't copy anything zero, so I didn't modify anything in the buffer in P, but I still have an error now. So I'm gonna use the errors package that new to create a new error based on the string that I've constructed. So now, if once my code reformats, so now I have this test that says before you, well, this should come before I try to copy anything into the buffer. That would be important. So before I try to copy anything to the buffer, after I've done all my encoding, so let's take this out, not confuse you when you review this code, dead code. So after I've done all the work to encode, um, so this is part of encoding the name. We don't need, notice, we don't need to encode the length of the search query number because we said that's always going to be 11. So if we always put that in for these three records only, we're going to use three extra bright bytes that we don't need to use. So keep that in mind when you're doing this in a real project, everywhere you can save a byte from the user having to download it or send it is better for your application. Okay. So anyway, so that's why we're not encoding search security number. But if we had a different string here, besides social security numbers whose length could change, let's say maybe phone number. If you had phone number as a string, and maybe some of the user's phone number, depending on where they live, might take on different length, then yes, you need to include the length of that field also. And of course, when you use other types also. All right, so going back to this problem, well, we just addressed that bug that we had where we weren't accounting for the fact that if the P wasn't big enough, we would still try to copy it. And even when it failed to copy all the data, we'd still mistakenly return that we actually copied. So now this is much better. And so this is gonna work fine. And um, as you can see, we still have room in our buffer. But if I reduce the size of my buffer to, uh, let's say 110, let's say, and if I were to check for a value, for failure, sorry, um, failure, after each time I call this function, these functions, I would see that, oh, at some point it's going to fail. So I'm here I'm checking for failure every time I call it, and of course before I go on to using it. So let me put this after the function call, and then let's see um, I should have a failure right here, one of these places. So I'm not going to stop and re-record. Oh, buffer is not big enough, as you can see. Okay. And so we required 21 bytes, provided only nine. And so if we actually print out um, our buffer by copying this and then printing it out, and I don't know which one of these failed. Okay. Um, but if I put it in each one and I print out, I say, let's print out the buffer before it prints out, um, before it terminates, we should actually see how much data was copied into it already. And so you could see that we were able to copy in some data. Then I had nine bytes left, but it wasn't enough to do the next copy. Okay. So that shows you that now we are content for the fact that oh, we can fill up our buffer and we properly handle in the case of returning that, you know, how many bytes were actually used that time when we fail. So you can use it any number of ways you want. If you want, you can say, well, I'm going to try and copy as much as I want in, in which case you would save this as, um, you know, some value. Um, you say n is equal to this and then just simply return n. And so that would tell you how many was actually copied. But then now you'd still need to do this comparison to say, well, I only copied N, but I actually needed more. 
and so you still would have to account for the fact that you didn't get to copy all the data you wanted to copy and so here i can say if n is less than the number of buffer than than the buffer um than than buffer that we want to copy than the length of the buffer this was an error else i return in this and so this now give you a slightly different error message where uh, well actually i was expecting this to be um so you see how many we copied in we copied in the rest but it um it was still not big enough i was expecting our copy function to return how many bytes was copied and that did not happen oh that's because i'm returning zero here ah that's why um <laughs> so we need to return n here and so now when i run this i should see nine so nine bytes were used up in that buffer on that call and and hence it matches up with this so it all depends on your preference of how you want to implement it personally i prefer to t check first before i do the copy and then if i can't copy it then i return a message and i don't affect that buffer at all but some application might say well it's better to have some partial data than no data so again it would depend on your requirement and you would work that out with your team blah 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 so different application different things but for this example we do it that way now this video is very 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 long so hopefully by going through it painfully slow like that and showing you how the data gets filled in the buffer um now you can see um how i got the data that we used to use to implement the right and you can use this example and use the same data and reuse it with the right and see if you can re encode if you can decode these bytes back into whatever data was used to encode them and it should work in the very next example we're going to see using implementing something that looks like a file but it's going to be memory that we're going to write into and we're going to be able to read out of so stay tuned um take care thanks for your time thanks for the thumbs up and watching the videos Keep doing that and spreading the word as usual and see you in the next video. Take care. Bye.